I'm so pleased to be back in Ledbury after I think 19 years. And um, I uh, was uh, told by my assistant uh, that she would come to this reading if I only read poems that I hadn't published before. So I, this is all, these are all new poems. I, I think um, making a fool of yourself in front of all these people is always more exciting than doing it in private, which I do on a regular basis. It's so very good to meet and read with you, Tony Hoagland. Thank you for uh, being here, and uh, I had the good luck yesterday of um, spending some time with Catherine and Jacqueline and Tony in a place called the Prince of Wales, where we fell into a, um, nothing terrible. Uh, <laughs> we were discussing um, we were discussing whether poetry is dialogue or monologue. And of course, poets just make shit up as they go along anyway, so it was either one or the other, back and forth. Um, I want to add my thanks to uh, Anne and David Toombs for the great uh, hospitality you've shown me yet again, and all the kindnesses and sponsoring this event. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here. I said my first answer to your question about dialogue or monologue was that I thought it was a dialogue. that. We keep going back and forth. Tony thinks it's a monologue, yourself talking to yourself. I think that's the way I got it. No, he'll explain it to you in his own, on his own. Uh, but anyway, it reminded me of a correspondence I've kept up with years now with a, a man whose name is Michael Heffernan, a wonderful poet, internationally unheard of like the rest of us, and uh, ignored on seven continents. Um, but he, um, he and I have kept up. Uh, a correspondence. I probably wouldn't write poetry unless I first discovered poems in the making in his office one time and thought, living people do this, because up until that time I thought you had to be like horizontal to be doing this, because all that we ever studied at school were dead poets. So um, over time we've both gotten older and crankier and uh, fallen into bad habits of indolence and, and uh, uh, so we don't so much talk anymore. The only thing we do is occasionally write poems back and forth. And for a long time, we corresponded on three by five cards on which you could fit a sonnet. And at the time, we could mail it for 14 cents. And we thought this was the postal service imitating art. You know? <laughs> so they went back and forth. And, back, and they found their ways into books. And I'd read you some, except I'm under ban of reading anything that I publish in a book. So this one isn't. It's, they've gotten longer because the poster rates have gone up. So uh, a couple of Novembers ago, I got this note from Heffernan one morning. We send them by text or email now, but they're still in verse. So here's what Heffernan had to write to me. What are you doing, Lynch? What's going on? It's night in Arkansas where I am, 5 a.m., November 8th, 2014. And I am actually feeling quite well. One month and 12 days from 72, I'm... Feeling very well, in fact, I am to tell the truth itself without a bit of hesitation or exaggeration. I ate a pizza all by myself last night. The cheese alone could kill me, but it won't. As you are fond of saying, doctors kill, so I see mine as little as I can. I walk around, I notice trees and deer that walk around in pastures here in town, set back behind the hoses, little spots with ruins of old Older houses, cellar holes, where people gone a hundred years ago put their provisions and the stuff they kept against the days to come and walked around not much unlike the way I do and looked and watched the days go by by them as they will. What is the day like where you are, my friend? <laughs> so you wake up with, you have to respond. Poetry being, as we say, a dialogue. <laughs> This has no title either. I'm up at the lake, Hef. Thanks for asking. A gray morning, windless, dewy, cool. It's almost 10 a.m., November 8, 2014, and I am likewise feeling well enough, not yet a month since I turned 66. Yes, yes, I am sufficiently informed to make some plans for what I'd like to do with whatever's left to me of time. Last night, I made myself a bowl of soup beef barley soup, progresso, in a can, with a sleeve of saltine crackers on some of which I spread a little butter. Then 
read a book by some old leatherneck who fought with my father at Cape Gloucester. The day that you were born in 42, they were both in boot camp near San Diego. By the time you were two, they were changed forever. I'm haunted by those years and what came after, so that this morning as I look into the gray maw of air and land and water, north to Sheboygan, west to Tapana Bee, they seem like us, a little lost at sea. The, um, of course, the other great responsorial habit of poets is to steal what they can from all other poets, as Eliot said we ought, and, um, and so I've been listening to the poets all my life, not so much because I admired the work, but because I thought I could steal something from them for my own purposes. Many of you will remember the marvelous Heaney poem about St. Kevin and the Blackbirds, or the Blackbird, I think, singular, uh, uh, an epic story of uh, supplication and holiness where St. Kevin stretched his arms out in the small um, stone oratory he occupied and was just going to say perhaps an Our Father or a Glory Be, a Rosary maybe, I don't know, but whatever happened to Blackbird landed uh, in the palm of one hand and lay an egg. And he had to, for the rest of Lent, <laughs> hold out his arms uh, because he was a, 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 you know, a nature lover. He's a nurturer. He was a nurturer. So I have taken that story. I did a little more research into St. Kevin's uh, history and biography, and so this one is called St. Kevin and the Temptress after Heaney. And it's based on true accounts. After that business with the blackbird, Kevin sore shouldered from his mortifications, the lent long arms reach and supplications in service of life's mysteries and flights, lay himself outspread eagled in paschal light, cozy in a copse of alders, cones, and catkins, and slept the sleep of a child of God, waking to a woman fast to straddle him in ways he'd never e'er experienced, and sensing frenzy in his nether regions, so lovely that it must be mortal sin. He strove against the ginger-haired Kathleen, pressing her pudenda against his parts, whilst writhing midst her own deliriums, the palms of her small hands warm to his heart, like riding the tide of love's deep river, groaning approval and grateful te deums, a prayer her being made entirely. Whereupon the monk woke to his senses and grabbing the temptress by her attributes in righteous warp spasms of rectitude, tackled her into the lock's chill waters. The better to chasten, he thought, brute nature, mighty as it was, please God, and that was that. <laughs> uh, that outstretched arm uh, always reminds me of the um, sign I was born under, which is Libra, which I think involves a scale that can never decide which way to go. I still have trouble with decisions. Uh, here's a poem called Libra. The one who pulled the trigger with his toe spread eagled on his girlfriend's parents' bed and split his face in halves above his nose so that one eye looked east, the other west. Sometimes that sad boy's bifurcation seems to replicate the math of love and grief, that zero sum of holding on and letting go by which we split the differences with those with whom we occupy the present moment. Sometimes I see that poor corpse as a token of doubt's twin and double-mindedness, of sure balance and the countervailing guess, the swithering that niggles at righteousness, like Libra's starry arms outstretched in love or supplication or at last surrender to scales forever tipped in a cold sky. I was in um, Venice uh, a few years ago visiting a friend for his birthday. I travel a lot for funerals and it seems to me that I ought to start traveling for birthdays. So. <laughs> Uh, this lifelong friend was turning 75, and I thought I should show up for it, so I did. Uh, we went to Venice because he had a, a 
dental appointment in Padua, which is good news. He has teeth to work on. And, um, and I said, I'll spend the day in, in Venice. I, we ended up spending four or five days. And I went into this church, San Cassiano. Many, maybe you've been to it. But the poem is called San Cassiano, uh, and it's for Dualco di Dona and his doctor, Francesco Palladini, uh, a boyhood friend who turned into a medical man. St. Cassian of Imola refused all sacrifices to the gods of Rome, pagan as they seemed to him so true to form. The emperor ordered him executed. It was Julian the apostate who gave the teacher over to his students because they bore abundant grudgeries for the rigors of the saints strict tutelage. What little of his story is still known involves the stake they bound him to, the slow torment of their style in sizing him as if his flesh were wax on which to grave the saga of his grisly martyrdom, the 13th of August, 363, which became wherefore his official feast. Some centuries after that, they built a church and christened a square for him in Venice commissioned paintings by Tintoretto, the crucifixion, the risen Christ with saints, the descent of Jesus into limbo, postcards of which are offered now for sale to faithful and apostate, one and all. I paid the toll and lit a candle there and sent a card that read, wish you were here. <laughs> Women always get that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, this is also about my life with my beloved. It's called Accordion, and for the longest time, it didn't seem like I wrote this, and I kept writing to friends saying, did you ever write a poem called Accordion? And uh, it actually finally got to Matthew Sweeney, who I thought probably wrote it, but he didn't remember writing it, and so I've claimed it. It's mine. <laughs> it's called Accordion. It's about my wife and me. We'd been invited to a neighborhood do, a graduation maybe, or a barbecue. We were underdressed, the missus and me, but I had my accordion, which is unfailingly a compensation. Whatever happened, there was this shoot, like the slides we played on in our childhoods. It ascended from the center of the neighbor's yard into the heavens beyond the sky like a spiral staircase without the steps. And it came into my brain they'd like to hear something from the topmost heights of it. So I began to climb on all fours with the accordion on my back, wheezing out the occasional chord, myself huffing and puffing with the baffling labor of it, my wife's sweet face gaping heavenward, the locals wide-eyed with the spectacle. Everything was shaky at the top, which I accomplished. I know that for sure, though I can't for the life of me remember what number I played them or the applause that would have just as certainly followed. We were fairly winded, the accordion and me. What with the whole performance? <laughs> um, some of the poets yesterday, we were happy to hear, uh, were reading Brexit poems. And, um, and I, as every American, well, in the country formerly known as the United States, <laughs> now known as Trump Landistan, um, <laughs> we all feel like we should write something about what it is that has happened. And so I couldn't do that, but on the day after the inauguration, I was invited from my isolation up at the lake uh, to attend a march in Traverse City with women of my acquaintance. And uh, I thought, that sounds good. But I took the dog for a walk, and on the walk I made this poem. It's called Franchise. And I never did make it to Traverse City, and most of those women are no longer my friends. <laughs> Franchise. So, 53% of white women cast what votes they cast for President Trump because Benghazi or deleted emails or else because the lesser of evils. With all, they couldn't fathom how he won and organized a march on Washington with sister marches all across the globe and held their higher ground and boldly strolled the malls and main streets with their indignations and 
rallied citizens across the nations to say that women's rights were human rights and equal pay for equal work. I might have wondered why we hadn't marched before, why 40-some percent forgot to vote. But still I thought we're all in this together, so donned my marching boots, dressed for the weather, hoist up a sign that said, please tread with me, then walk the dog up Temple Road alone. Some women go for men who march with them, still more with those who grab them by the pussy. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time alone, as you might gather. From... Yeah. <laughs> and after years of it, I thought I'd come up with one of those ads they put in the paper soliciting uh, companionship. And uh, though I never placed the ad, um, I, I wrote a poem called personal, because that's what we call the ad, so on. Am old and fat and bald and married, twice. Don't drink, don't smoke, I piss and moan too much, I fart and snore, but otherwise I'm nice enough. And though I am not rich, rich, I want for nothing. Some say I'm generous to a fault, others that I'm too forgiving. I'm looking for someone to travel with to Ireland early on next year. I have a small place on the coast of County Clare between Kilkee and Lucad. Check the map. It is lovely, wild, treeless country. Between the ocean and the estuary, great sunsets, cliff walks by the sea, wild flowers, rainbows, rolling meadows. You get the picture. The little bookish festivals are fun. The nights infused with merriment and song. Maybe. You'd rather long talks by the fire, twisting relations with the brogy neighbors suit yourself. You can plan to sleep alone. I'm only looking for some conversation, someone to share the mealtimes with, the road, the eventual sadness of it all. I'm so tired of talking to myself. I want to hear another voice reply, maybe ask how my day went. Would I like a sup of decaf, a lump of goat cheese? I don't know. No hard and fast requirements, no romance or bungee jumping, just some ordinary talk, no feigned orgasms, no swooning afterglow, just some chit-chat and commiseration for a month or so. I lift the seat. I wipe it clean. <laughs> I put it down again. I have uh, this house up north, my son named Lion's End, and figured I'd die there. I, there's, I have options, but but he thought Lion's End was the proper. I have a brother-in-law who does logo wear, so we had to put that on the coffee cups and the t-shirts and things. So <clears throat> Lion's End, this is just a description of how you get there. Where Temple Road becomes West Temple Road, a sign points left. Go straight downhill instead. The way down to the lake ends with a load of boulders dumped behind a rusting fence declaring access closed. Thus, all lines end. The county quit its easement by decree years back when Howard Brown took them to court, noting the willows and the walnut trees grown massive while the public works ignored their upkeep of the public's right of way. That compound on the left is Howard's place. He built the barricade against a scheme a neighbor had to build a boat landing for campers who populate his back 40. But Howard's side of things won on the day, so half that no man's land devolved to us, sumac and scrub pine, some spindly maples, the walnuts and willows all remain, border enough and bit of privacy between the browns, the main, and all of us, fetched up here our acre on the lake with its long view of approaching weather. A clapboard cottage we remodeled some. That's us there on the right. Thanks be, lines end, and all lead home. Genesis 3. In Defen Dante Ferrari's panel of Eve tempted by the serpent, only a filigree leaf frond from a sapling tree tastefully obscures her mons veneris. For the moment, she is still ignorant, not yet embarrassed by her nakedness, how God managed in his heaven fashioned her. Later, she'll get blamed for everything, her blush, her breast, 
which in this image are those of a 14 or 15 year old, will become sources of pleasure and its shame. The serpent's head is an old bearded man leering at her all lechery. Yes, yes, it must be hissing as she bends the branch and reaching upwards with her perfect hand takes hold of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. This is the last hour of paradise. The girl and her consort oblivious to good and evil and their ramifications. Their bites of the tree's fruit are not yet taken. The fig leaves are only fig leaves. Their genitalia not yet shameful. The creator still happy with creation. The pendant canvas in which Adam appears ready to give into all temptation has been lost, alas, to the centuries. Nor can we know now how he held her at the end, grateful, glad for the taste of her, her touch and constancy. I think um, I better move along to this one. This is a Christmas poem. I, against uh, the notion of um, writer's block, I thought, well, writer's block is better than plumber's block, but once a year I thought I'd better <laughs> knock out a poem. So. I, I, uh, I decided I'd do it for Christmas and make it a Christmas card and send it out. This was one a couple of years ago. It's called The Twelve Days of Christmas. Some pilgrims claim the carol is a code for true believers and their catechists. To wit, four collie birds, four gospel texts, eight maids a-milking the Beatitudes, and pipers piping the eleven left once Judas had betrayed the Lamb of God, that partridge in a pear tree the holy one and only whose nativity becomes in just a dozen days the starlit eve of three French hens with their epiphanies huddled around the family in the manger, tendering their gold and frankincense and myrrh. The whole tune seems to turn on five gold rings, that Pentateuch, those first books of the Torah, in which ten lords a-leaping stand in for the Ten Commandments cut in loaves of stone which Moses broke over his wayward tribesmen, two turtle doves, two testaments, old and new, six geese a-laying creations, short and weak, the swimming swans, gifts of the Holy Ghost, whose fruit becomes with all nine ladies dancing, twelve drummers drumming, the Apostles' Creed, a dozen doctrines to profess belief in. Still others say it's only meant to praise fine feathered birds and Characters and rings are singing nothing more than thanksgiving for litanies of undeserved grace, unnumbered blessings, the lights increasing our brightly festooned trees bedazzling. Her mother's irises. No ideas but in things I tell her, <clears throat> Dr. Williams tells us in a poem. Say it. This is just to say those plums in the fridge, a red wheelbarrow upon which so much does indeed depend the glaze of rainwater, the white chickens. Present in their bland thing as a key, a cipher for the mystery of things, and here's something. She walks out to the sea, returning with the wildflowers picked on the anniversary of, his mother, of her mother's death, now 16 Junes ago and how her father kept a paper bag full of dusty tubers, saved for his daughter, small consolations. Her mother's irises now grown beyond her care. It is a thing with her. She sows them everywhere. I keep in Ireland, um, among other uh, beloved things, uh, several piebald asses. I got one years ago to serve as a lawnmower for the haggard, which was overgrowing, and I couldn't bear to have a lawnmower out there. I thought it would look too suburban. And uh, so I bought an ass, a jackass, and uh, after a while he began to roar as if something was really missing. So I went and bought another one, and she was, uh, the, the first one I called Charles, because of the ears, and the, uh, and the other one I called Camilla, because that was the year I got her. You Morning are. among piebalds. This standing stillness among ruminants inclines, inclines towards contemplations, perfectly indifferent to a day's contingencies. 
news of the world, some word on the weather. And as for speaking to one another, only in so far as communicants extend their tongues like gate for Eucharist. We yawn along a day's communion rail. This presence, whether virtual or real, we hunger after such companionships. And so my piebald asses lolling move in their haphazard unison as if the hedge and green sword were their common table. The silence hums a sort of reverence for being and creation and the life insouciant still mindlessly alive. Buskers. I think I'll finish with this. No, as Dante said, just two more. <laughs> Buskers. He reckoned she'd likely go for the busker in Shop Street off Air Square with a top knot and sacks, a wasp row with wavefish, world weary good looks. He'd curl into a grin, singing harmony with the darkly fetching lead singer. She liked him too. He imagined her making for the road with them, maybe doing percussions and backup vocals, city to city across the globe, the object of their conjoined desires. Wendy to their lost boys. A woman with lovers and cool allure, such mysterious beauty to her being that years after they'd still be whispering of it. Her lurid journals eventually published in dozens of languages, all of them gold. And let me finish with a poem that is in a book um, which proves the point that poets lie. <laughs> But I want to say uh, again what gratitude uh, I have to, uh, to any of you to come in from a, such a beautiful day to listen to this. It's like going to the shrink and not getting a bill for it. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll finish with this. It's called, uh, it's called Refusing at 52 to Write Sonnets. It's a real old poem, but I wrote it for a birthday. And then I counted up the lines. It turns out to be 15, which proves that um, the older we get, the less we count. And you can try this at home. <laughs> it came to him that he could nearly count how many Octobers he had left to him in increments of 10 or, say, 11, thus 63, 74, 85. He couldn't see himself at 96, Humanity's advances notwithstanding in health care, self-help, or new age regimens. What with his habits and family history? The end, he thought, is nearer than you think. The future thus confined to its contingencies. The present moment opens like a gift. The bluing month, the gray week, the blue morning, the hours routine, the minutes passing glance, all seem like God sends now, and what to make of this? At the end, the word that comes to us is thanks. <laughs>